Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Rev Bytes with your host, Doug Truitt, Head of Revenue Success at Reynolds United, and myself, John DeRolay, uh, yes. Revenue Management Expert at Wheelhouse. <laughs> uh, today, we're going to be having another uh, 20, 30 minute, maybe 40 minute conversation about revenue and distribution topics in the vacation rental and SDR spaces. Uh, this is our sixth episode. We're just coming back from kind of, you know, uh, uh, the DARM conference, which was a lot of fun. Um, if you haven't, uh, you know, Heard too much about it. I know that they're going to make a lot of those sessions available. Uh, so maybe reach out. Those there's some interesting conversations there. I, I you might see Doug and I uh, talking about some interesting stuff. So really good stuff. And we're we're getting ready for uh, convention season all around. Doug, you'll be at um, yeah. uh, Streamline next week, yeah. uh, and then we'll this both week, be at actually, Burma yeah. this week. Yeah, <laughs> it's already yeah. this week. I'll be at Streamline this week, and then um, yeah, I think those videos for Darm. I think they said it was. They, on the site, they say it's, they'll be available September 8th. So that's two days from now. So definitely go and check out their site and uh, see about getting some of those. And I'm sure there's some of the folks who attended who will have access, might post some snippets of videos or something on, on social media too. Totally. Um, but today, what we're talking about is uh, our it's our sixth episode, and we're going to be talking about silo breaking, uh, integrating distribution, revenue, marketing, and sales. Um, we know that uh, it's kind of an interesting topic that came up a lot at DARM, which is you know uh, kind of two parts. When you're a small organization, um, you probably have someone wearing all these same hats. And how do you think about, as you grow, uh, separating some of these uh, responsibilities, and then also making sure that they don't stay separated, but that these teams are able to work in conjunction with each other. Um, so we'll start off with a joke KPI as we've been doing. Um, we're, we're people of tradition. And so today's joke KPI is form var, <laughs> the variance of number and text formats that exist between data exported from your systems that cause errors in aggregating data that make you have to manually check every reservation in the PMS. <laughs> <laughs> I know that we've all made reports, right, Doug? <laughs> yeah. The term, the term is like, oh, I got the data. And then it's like, oh, wait a second. I got to do a bunch of control H and replace and refine uh, re or uh, find and replace uh, <laughs> crap that's like emojis or other kinds of crap that sits in there. Even just spaces. Oh, my God. Spaces. Eliminating spaces from data just to get what you need. Uh, the big one I had when I was doing some M&A stuff, we were looking at a lot of European uh, clients, and they use... Uh, they don't use a period for the decimal. They use like a a, a comma. And so when you when they send <laughs> yeah. you that document and you open it in a US version, it changes everything to text. And then your entire thing is screwed. Like you have to yeah. <laughs> you have to fix everything. <laughs> yeah, that I definitely can relate with that. Uh, working for working for a European company, I've had to deal with that kind of translation myself on certain things. Uh, it's pretty funny. So hopefully you guys don't have a lot of reports that you're putting together with high form VAR because uh, you know we we know how difficult it is for analysts. Oh god. <laughs> um, but let's get started with the conversation today. We know it's Labor Day, so uh, we'll uh, give you something to listen to when you're trying to get back into the office. Um, but let's just start out with Doug. Why is it important for distribution, revenue, marketing, and sales to work together? Um, um, you know, I I think. I think the most important reason for me really just comes back to like, what are those, what are the common goals that, you know, the main big goals of each of those departments and they should be, they should be aligned with what the company goal is, which is make more money, right? Um, gain new customers, new money um, and, and get it in. So I think, I think that's, that's why it's important for those teams to meet. I mean, if, if revenue and distribution and sales and marketing aren't all trying to be focused on the same ways to get new money in or revenue in, um, then there's going to be, there's going to be problems. I mean, there's just going to be problems because you're not going to get to the goal fast enough because people are all kind of rowing in different directions. Um, so that's kind of my thought. What do you think? Um, I mean, I think they inherently have to, and I think for small organizations, it's a lot easier to comprehend because you probably don't have different people and different KPIs. So they seem really integrated when you're in a smaller environment that's growing because the same person is probably doing them and they already kind of inherently understand how those, those things are related to each other. But as you grow and you bring on new people who are more specialized in specific places, I think it's really easy for teams to um, 
to kind of forget how the different aspects or just not be aware of how the different aspects uh, are related to each other. And so what happens with all of these different um, organizations or parts of the organization is they all pull levers that that actually influence the other organizations. So if they're not coordinating on what they're doing, you're either pulling levers that are changing things for other people that may or may not be aligned with the goals that they have set for themselves, uh, or you may be pulling levers that aren't doing anything because other people are doing something else that's affecting it. Um, I think that that's a big thing. A good example, I, one of the early splits I think that happens or splits that happen at, at a lot of different levels is marketing tends to be pretty separated early and sales yeah. tends to be pretty separated early, right? Uh, they have different kind of infrastructures. They have stuff that cross over with operations. So you tend to pull them out. I think distribution and revenue tend to stay pretty linked for, for a lot of growth periods um, because distribution people and revenue people are in the same systems. Bro. Yeah. Um, but that marketing one is, you know, you know, I remember in our, my previous experience and I've heard from companies is marketing is like, has these certain goals. They're trying to drive certain things. Uh, but, it really, I think, is it, you can set it up as a perspective of like the revenue teams can really support the marketing initiatives through information. You know, if like marketing's like, we really want to do these kind of, you know, initiatives, we're going to offer these discounts, we're going to do this, you know, it's helpful for your revenue team to be like, I don't really want to discount this time range, or I don't want to discount these properties, like if you're yeah. doing fine, or like, this is where we actually have occupancy gaps. Is there anything, you know, can we use this initiative to do that. And that kind of alignment is really key. Um, yeah, I think about I think about like how like some of the core functions of like marketing, right? I mean, you think of marketing as like brand, but also like, you know, the initial start of like impressions to acquisition. And I think of like, you know, we talked about it a little bit at Darm too, about how like, you know, distribution is one thing, revenue management is one thing as far as the efforts to try and gain, you know, attractive by setting the right price at the right time on the right channel for the right customer. But a lot of times I think what happens is that marketing has this hold in the CRM, basically they're CRM masters, right? They have that hold of all the email addresses and contacts and, you know, those kinds of valuable pieces of data. And, you know, we talked about at Darm how like, you know, distribution and revenue management will like think that the throttles and the levers are all with promotions and different channels and this and that and the other. And sometimes it's like, well, what did you already get from those channels and from those efforts in the past that are sitting in post marketing kind of strategies that the marketing team has? And it's like, well, marketing, what is your email campaigns going on right now? Who are you sending stuff out to? And what are you telling people? And could we potentially be saying, hey, let's bring and merge like distribution revenue management data of like booking windows for certain properties, certain markets in with the marketing team to say, Hey, take a list of all the bookings of these email contacts that booked this many days out from this date range. And let's send them a, send them an email, see if we can tease them to come into the site and then watch them come to the site and watch that behavior to kind of, you know, dictate how to move forward. Yeah. I think, um, <clears throat> One of the hardest aspects of of both growing and then having to you know create separate teams to do these things and then keeping them integrated is keeping is like KPI alignment, right? Mm -hmm. Is because that tends to occur in a silo. You're looking at like what do these um, what do these different teams do? What do they specialize in? How do we judge that? And then how do we tie that to their like performance? And what can happen is um, because their functions are actually really integrated with each other you can create incentives for an individual team that do not align with what you're actually trying to do, which is raise your rev par, raise your margin, you know, or both. Right. Um, and that's actually, I think, a really big risk, right? Because these, these, you know, when you're thinking of KPIs, we kind of tie them directly to the function of the team, but the what's actually occurring in the ecosystem is really complex. Mm -hmm. um, so like some examples of like how this gets complex is like, you know, KPIs around like driving direct booking and stuff like this, you know, people can reach those KPIs without it being obvious that they're doing it at the expense of something that actually contributes to the bottom line. Yep. Um, so like two examples of like a direct booking KPI is you can drive direct bookings, but your cost to acquire becomes like really, really high. Yeah. You know, like higher than it would be if you were driving through an OTA or your overall booking activity goes down, you know, 
So because it's a proportion-based thing. Uh, another one I think where there's really easy misalignment is um, is in your sales teams. Sales teams, I think there's always kind of a natural tension between them and revenue teams to a certain degree because uh, sales teams tend to be individually incentivized. Yep. Uh, and revenue teams are in the position to say no to things. Um, and that can that's something that like, what I found in my past experience, the way to work around that is you have to develop a really strong personal relationship between those teams and you have to, the revenue team has to be proactive because if you're just saying no to deals to a sales team, you're going to very quickly make your sales team very hostile to you or they're just not going to do well. They're, they're going to stop, yeah. you know, they're going to lose steam. Um, so what we had done is, and we did this with the marketing team too, is really try to kind of let them know what we were expecting in the next quarter. Because if we told them like, hey, this is what we're expecting in seasonality. This is kind of like what we're expecting in terms of occupancy. This is where we think we're going to be weak, where we're going to be strong, where we need some help. And we would give them that for a quarter or two quarters in advance and then let them take that and start coming and you and then apply what they were thinking in terms of their ideas and initiative and it kind of switches that concept to being very collaborative you know the revenue team and the distribution teams can can work together to talk about like how the ecosystem should look at the market level and then those sales and marketing teams can can be very specific about how they want the company to approach it whereas yeah. When it's flipped, where they all your sales team or your marketing team are doing all this stuff, and they're coming and being like, "Hey, we're going to do all this," and your revenue and distribution teams are like, "Let's not do that." Like, yeah. you're not gonna, you're gonna, it's gonna be really hard to work together. <laughs> yeah, I re I remember some like specific examples from the sale for days where like the sales team, you know, they would want they would want revenue or distribution to like block availability for certain date ranges of certain events because they they wanted to give the themselves and their lead lists and everything else more opportunity to try and, and, you know, convert that, that availability so that they could actually hit stuff because they knew that those were easier dates to convert um, than it would be if it was just like, I'm trying to fill, like, for example, if it was like Mardi Gras or something like that, you know, like trying to fill it some other way. But like you were saying, like there's risks with that kind of mentality too. Cause I know a lot of, a lot of property management companies will play the blackout, the blackout game where they'll actually blackout dates for, for certain channels and things like that and try to do that in order to let their direct site book. And really what ends up hurting because of it being demand dates is like, okay, maybe you got, you know, a good chunk to your direct, but if you would potentially leave the OTAs open and mark up the OTAs a premium, over your direct site, then you allow people to discover you on your direct site for cheaper. So you can, you can acquire it there, but you also keep your availability open for all the impression and the eyeballs that you potentially can get out there that only helps everything in general. And so it's kind of like you said, like you're, you're kind of, you're cut, cutting off one leg just to, to try and, you know, help another initiative for somewhere else when it's like, really, you're, you might be losing on your, your margin because you're slowing down the amount of revenue you potentially could be getting in at a certain time to hit your, your rev par goals. Totally. So Doug, what do you think are some ways, like how, what are some ways that this can be structured for these teams to work together? Like, what do you think are good approaches for a company that's growing, maybe has developed these different or is in the process of developing these different departments? How would you go about organizing your organization so that these teams can work together effectively? Um, it's, it's really complex to think about as far as like a, a playbook or so to speak of how to do it. But I think it comes in the form of, of identifying, you know, personalities within the, the folks on these, these specific teams, right? I feel like you have to kind of have one person who can kind of, you know, um, be the mediator, so to speak, and kind of be that person who can kind of, you know, navigate conversations and meetings between each of these departments in a very healthy and productive way, because sometimes it can get lost into a lot of technical stuff um, from one aspect. And then sometimes you can get really lost from a selfish aspect in some other areas and having somebody who can hear people out and try to still keep the whole team on point. I mean, sometimes that could be a CEO. Sometimes that could be a, a chief revenue officer. Sometimes that could be a chief marketing officer. Um, it could even be just a marketing manager or a distribution manager or somebody like that. But if you have somebody on your team who just seems to be that person who can really listen to people, but then also can really provide some great insights and not have it be super biased, I think that's really a good thing to do to identify that person to help in kind of, you know, leading that. 
the the second part is set up some really good like hard and fast like we always meet on thursdays we always meet on this day and even if there isn't a whole lot to talk about keep it religious and do that meeting because sometimes it's nice if you don't have any really big items to go and you may not fill the full hour or 30 minutes or however long you meet you could talk about other things and kind of be creative and think about new things to the, to, to constantly uh you know innovate and think it might help the the company um the third thing I would say is really keep it fun, you know, even set up maybe potentially like once a quarter or once a month where everybody on those teams just kind of go out and have a beer or do something fun to really integrate those teams together because they all got to row in the same direction, which kind of like you said before, I think, uh, John, is like people got to like work with each other and they got to want to be aligned on the goals. And so sometimes that comes with, you know, having some of that, you know, gif off on Fridays or something or, you know, grab beers or go bowling or do something laser quest, laser tag or something and just really get those teams, you know, to really in, in encompass that team revenue kind of aspect because that's really what they are. They're the ones that are bringing in the revenue um, and making it happen. Um, the last thing I would say, my biggest recommendation is don't exclude anybody. Um, meaning have your leaders of those departments there and kind of really being the ones who speak up and take charge of certain things, but include all the team, bring them all in. Everybody has something potentially good to add value to, but if you can have that one person who's kind of the mediator or whatever, set an agenda and kind of help keep people on task and on point for the meeting, um, I think it's really important to keep everybody included because everybody in those departments have a lot to add to it, whether you're small or big. Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. I think, um, especially on like your distribution revenue marketing sales, the thing to remember is that there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. And so you may have these disagreements about what you're trying to do between these, these teams. And it's not necessarily that like one of them is the right answer and the other ones are wrong. It's like, they're all a probably effective ways to do something but they may not be aligned with with the direction you want to go and you need someone who's actually able to make that decision who's able to sit there <laughs> listen to what the different teams are proposing or listen to their criticisms about the different ideas that's important too because a lot of yeah. the time you'll have an idea and you're like okay well this is the ramif this is like revenue side this is the potential ramification we're going to have if we do this you know we're taking a risk by not selling and then selling at the last minute or you know we're, we maybe are going to displace a bunch of higher revenue stuff by holding this inventory back or by discounting it or distribution may say, Hey, we can do that, but this is how we have to do it. It's going to be really weird. You know, we can't do it across all the channels. Um, yeah. So you need someone to listen to all those things, or maybe there's different ideas and to be able to say, okay, these are all great ideas. Uh, you know, maybe, but this is, I think what the direction we're going to go in this case, this is the, you know, they, they're the ones who are basically going to say, this is the strategy we're doing as the company. This is the direction we're going to choose to go. These are all great ideas. And maybe if you have a really good um, person who's in that role, he may also say, but these ideas, let's, uh, let's carve out some time and, and explore them for, for a future project because they are interesting, right? Um, so I think, you know, I'm really aligned with Doug that as these departments start to get split out, that you actually do need to set up a hierarchy. You need to look at your teams, and look at the individual personalities on your teams and find the person who is really an arbiter, a good listener, uh, someone who's, who's, who's got res like who the other team members respect their judgment because they know that they were listened to, even if that person doesn't go the route that they were proposing and, and put that person in a position to be a decision maker in those situations where the, it's not all lining up organically. Right. Yeah. Um, so make sure that someone, you know, so that could come from the teams themselves. It doesn't have to come from the CEO, CEO, mm -hmm. CEO. It might be the CEO, depending on the size of your organization, right. because he's the one who's setting the strategy and, and setting the direction. But you do need to be aware that someone needs to fill that role. They may not even be higher up than everyone else. As you get to a larger organization, it may be good to basically just align all these people under like chief revenue or chief marketing officer. That's what we did at Stay Alfred and that it didn't start that way. We actually had these people, like our yeah. teams were all over the place. We just were meeting consistently because we were like, we can't do this job without coordinating. And eventually we went to the, the executive team and we're like, can you just like put us all under the same chief executive? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it worked really well. We ended up working that, together really well. I think um, that was that was probably one of the best moves that we made in that rapid growth stage is to really have somebody come in and do that because 
we all we all did a great good job, but we were lacking that kind of unbiased approach from some some person to come in and say, okay, hey, okay, I hear everybody, but let's steer it back to this course because this is where we need to be. And that's that's a really tough role to do, and it takes a unique person to do it, especially with all the different personalities, like you said. Yeah. And so I think really bringing those people like as you grow, because it's, it's not going to be as applicable when you're small or just growing, because you probably in reality, it's going to be one or two or three people or a couple people across the organization and everyone's kind of sharing responsibilities. But once you start to get more um, like solidified in these different departments as you grow, you do want to make sure that they're aligned in a, in a hierarchical structure that allows them to work together. Um, and that can come out of their own interactions too. You don't have to like superimpose something, but I do think that kind of pushing them towards like, hey, who is the one who's gonna decide in the deadlock that you guys respect enough to all agree with and not be resentful about, you know? Um, yeah. On top of that, uh, I think weekly meetings are super key. Even if you don't have that person, you do want to meet uh, as a revenue organization or whatever you want to call it, sales organization, whatever. Um, and just talk about like the daily stuff. You know, people think, you know, sometimes it seems like you'll get that if you're doing revenue meetings weekly and talking about all of this, but you actually want to, you know, what we did is we kept it pretty short. We met at a stand up for 15 to 30 minutes every, you know, twice a week, once a week. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think it was once a week to start and I think it became like twice a week at one point. Yeah. And we just asked people to like, <laughs> come to the table with the three things their teams are working on or think are important right now. And really what that allowed us to do is just have conversations because we'd bring up like, hey, uh, you know, it just makes people think, right? Your marketing team is like, oh, we're working on this. And then revenue is like, man, this whole like, we're trying to figure out what to do about January because it's screwed. And marketing is like, well, why is it screwed? And distribution is yeah. like, oh, well, we'll look at it too and see if anything's broken, you know? So you kind of just align about these little things and it allows people to just reprioritize work um, or for someone to say like, hey, I'm not sure that that's that important right now. We've got this other thing going on or, hey, that's a really great idea. Is there anything I can do to support you? Um, because as you get larger and larger, what you'll find is that your marketing organization no longer knows how your distribution stuff works at a yeah. granular level or your revenue team doesn't know that like, hey, I just dropped the rates like 30% for this season. I didn't know that you put it or, you know, today releasing a marketing thing offering an additional discount you know yeah. um, so just those little things about like what you're doing are really important to, to coordinate on and from that we would maybe like set priorities as a group we'd say okay like this seems aligned is there anything we, we need to actually retouch on well it's like you said i mean there's each department has a certain toolbox right they they have a certain set of levers that they can do to help influence certain pieces within grabbing and converting more revenue right? Sales may create their own little promotional thing for a loyalty guest coming back that marketing didn't know about. Uh, distribution might be running a visibility booster or a promotion on a certain channel that, that sales didn't know about that then a guest is sending them a snapshot saying, I know you quoted me this, but this on the OTA is like 500 bucks less. Like I'm going to go with the OTA or revenue management, not being uh, able to say, Hey, I, I did, I dropped the length of stay settings by X in this market, whatever. And then other people are not really understanding why they're getting so much coming in or, you know, I mean, there's just like this, this component of like the ever changing toolbox, right? I mean, there is always going to be a certain layer of standard tools and levers that different departments have, but as you get bigger and maybe your tech grows, and other th other pieces come into play. You're going to discover new levers and new new ways to to influence certain things that if your other teams don't know about it, you might be doubling down your efforts, or you might be going against the efforts that make it a net uh, loss. Um, and which brings me to another point, which is cycle in other departments every once in a while so they know what you guys are doing. You know, as a as a team revenue or however you want to call it, like bring tech in. Right. I remember we brought tech in a few times when we were trying to work on doing a direct connection or trying to add a new component of like a chat bot in for the, the website for the, for the sales team and other aspects, you know, or bring operations teams in and have them see what, what the methodology and the process we're going through. So they understand when they have the guests actually checking in and phone calls are coming in, they can align with what those strategies were. So it's like, you know, it really starts with the revenue team. And they have to really bring in other layers and other other folks every once in a while just to make sure that you know the heart of the company is understanding what's going on. Yeah, I <clears throat> I really agree with that because part of the, having these little meetings is at the end of the day, what you'll find is like 
you're having, it, it may seem like a duplicative meeting if you're having full team meetings and stuff like that. But the specific aspect is you're having a meeting from the perspective of the revenue generating organization. Mm -hmm. So people will come to these meetings because all of these departments are multi-departmental. You know, you're working with operations teams, you're dealing with stuff in the field. And, and sometimes these teams will come to the table and be like, my priority is figuring out like why we're like, you know, how to communicate with these guests because the operations team did that. Sometimes that information is really helpful for like revenue team. They're like, oh, I didn't know that we were going to cut off bookings for three days before arrival. Like, yeah. we, like, can I, can I, like, maybe I should look into that too. <laughs> like, like, what's yeah. I going to do? Um, <laughs> you know, so those little things are, are really important. And I think as, especially as you grow, you're going to be bringing on people who are entering a more siloed organization. They're not going to have the widespread understanding of how the business works. So having these conversations continues to remind people about what the other possibilities are. So when they're trying to solve a problem that they think is they see as a marketing problem, you you are just remind you're continuing to kind of backfill knowledge for people on your teams about what can be done to solve problems, uh, which is harder and harder to do the larger you get because you're going to hire more and more specialized people. They're not going to have an awareness of how the distribution platforms work anymore. No. They're not going to understand the general seasonality of these these markets anymore. And by having these meetings. You're, you're able to kind of expand everyone's understanding of what's going on, both within the revenue organization and without, outside of the revenue organization. Yeah. Um, I think a big one that came, comes up in these is, you know, marketing is often dealing with operational stuff, right? Whether from the advertising side all the way to the guest communication side. And that stuff does affect revenue and distribution. You know, yeah. we know revenue on our teams tended to work very closely with distribution because revenue would be looking at, we have expectations about how booking should occur in the market. And if it's not like working in our portfolio, the go-to is to talk to the distribution teams and be like, is something broken, dude? Like, mm -hmm. is something not working right? Or is something not feeding through? Or like, are advertisements sucky? Like what, like, cause I, we expect this to book. And so I think another component of like, your leaders having these meetings, if you have enough people to have subordinates so that you're kind of all trying to row in the same direction. But you also want to have an environment, which I think helps having everyone aligned organizationally where your team members are working with other team members outside of the management level. So, you know, I know that on my revenue organization, my revenue organization had really strong relations with uh, people on the distribution team. It's like, if you think something's broken, go talk to them, go figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. the same thing was true with our sales organization. You know, whether that person, like you can do that <laughs> a couple ways, depending on how you have your responsibilities set up, maybe they all have like individual relations. Do you just build a trend of working together? on stuff. You know, that cross training is really helpful. These systems are super complex. Another way you can do it is set point people, like make sure that it's not just the managers communicating, like delegate that to your mm -hmm. subordinates and have them work with the other teams because it's going to help both teams. They're both going to get a greater understanding of what you're trying to do. And then they're going to be excited to work together to solve a problem instead of feeling like they're opposition, which is what you at the end of the day, what you really need to avoid is the risk that your teams feel like they're working in opposition when they're actually all part of a revenue generating organization in the company. Yeah. You uh, know, and I mean, maybe, a, maybe an inverse way to look at this too, you know, John is for people to understand like what actually creates silos, right? What are the things that actually create si silos in an organization? Um, I would say uh, in my opinion, it'd be lack of transparency, um, miscommunication or lack of communication. Um, right? The, the misalignment of goals, kind of like what you hit on a little bit too. Um, and then also um, a lack of empowerment, right? And I think you just hit on a few of those, which is like, you know, empower some people, make, make, give some people some responsibility and, and let them have some, you know, accountability to do something and be a part of something that they feel is bigger than themselves. I mean, really, nobody really wants to go into work just to move a, a widget from point A to point B. Sometimes they're going to want to grow and they're going to want to want to figure out, you know, their value and what they do. And if you can empower that, even with a small little responsibility you give them is such as like, hey, can you put together this agenda for the next team revenue meeting? Or could you put together this thing? And I want you to send this out like weekly to all the teams so they understand what's going on with these things. Like those kinds of things will keep the silos from breaking down because people will be excited to go talk to other departments about certain things or what's going on with them. Um, I know one thing for me that was really a big aha moment at Stay Offered was when it was towards the end of, end of days at Stay Offered, but when we put a chalkboard up um, and we just showed to the entire company because it was a big bull, bullpen thing, it was like, 
showing the thermometer of 30, 60, 90, and 120 days out of each of those months, what the revenue was, what the forecast was, and then what the ADR occupancy, whatever it was for the entire company for each of those months coming up. And it was just kind of a way to like, not hide anything, just keep it all out in the open, keep it honest with everybody, keep it transparent. And you is amazing how some people would be like, oh, that's cool. I had no idea we were that close to goal or I had no idea that we, you know, did that much revenue this, that month. That's super cool. Like it, it makes people feel valued and a part of something. And I think maybe that can prevent silos from forming, right? It's not just necessarily saying you break in the silos. It's like, keep them from forming. Yeah. I think that the thing to remember about silos is that, cause we always talk about it as a boogeyman, but we have to be <laughs> realistic, right? Is that if you are growing as an organization and you are scaling, the tide is always towards siloing. So it's not that like, if you're seeing this like habit of siloing, that's inevitable. Like the, the yep. tide is always going to move towards a greater level of specialization as you scale. Um, so as a leader, what you're trying to do is mitigate the negative effect of that siloing because you need yes. specialization. You can't train your specialists to do all these organizations the like you did. Yes. In there. Yeah, you need the experts. It's too complicated. So it, it's just it's always thinking about that in terms of balance because you're not going to stop that movement towards specialization. What yeah. you need to do is you need to mitigate it. And I think I really agree with you when I propose these philosophies that the best way to mitigate in these really complex environments is um, is empowerment. And as a leader, I'm a, I'm a really strong proponent of uh, not just doing this in a top-down way. You have to have a top-down way. And so part of these things are kind of like, like I, I'm going to keep saying this mitigator thing. If you know mm -hmm. that there's an arbiter, that's that's going to be how these teams are going to able, be able to move forward when you have conflict, which you're inherently going to have, like conflict in KPIs or conflict in, in expected resolution. But what I like to do is tell my subordinates, um, you know, if you're kind of, you know, building that trust or doing stuff, it's like, if there seems like there's going to be a conflict, one, it's your responsibility to be aware where there might be conflicts and tell your team members, go talk to that team explain to them what we're concerned about. And why don't you guys come back with like three compromises? Cause at the end of the day, it's always going to be a compromise, yes. right? Like, because the other team's not wrong. They're probably yeah. there. They have KPIs, you know, they need to make sales numbers. They need to make conversion numbers, whatever. They're not wrong. It's just, no. the ecosystem is actually more complex than just their KPI. And so it's like, go talk to them, learn what they're doing, ask them, why do we want to take this approach? Or what do you think we're going to get out of this? Because you might learn something. Um, chances are you will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Even if it's just as much as like I have to sell this many room nights by the end of the month. <laughs> like, how are you gonna help me do that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, come up with some solutions or compromises, and then have them make. And then you know, depending on where you're at with those people, you can either empower them to do that. You can give them different levels, or have them bring them back, and then bring them to that arbiter or bring them to that manager. Yeah and start to, to build things. Because a lot of what would come out of those conversations, I'd tell specialists, like, go talk to the sales team or go talk to the marketing team, ask them what they're doing. You know, just try to figure it out because this is what we think is going to happen. That's why we're like, why are they doing that? But just figure out what they're thinking. Yeah. And then let's see if we come up with an idea because sometimes the idea won't even, like, that you get out of that isn't even going to be related to the problem you thought you were going to solve. Yeah. It's like, oh, they're concerned about this whole thing. Maybe there's a different way we can approach that altogether like that's what came out of that sales thing is we were having all this issues with this sales team because we kept telling them no uh on sales and that you know if you're a sales team member you're like mad right yeah and um eventually we were just talking to them and i would go over as a manager and my team i would encourage my team to talk to people what they were trying to do and how they were like it was like how are you doing your sales process like how do they come in like how do you get leads mm -hmm. uh and what we ended up doing is just having a big meeting together and being like okay so we talked to you for a while and we think that this is a problem and this is what we think we can do to actually just help you meet your goals. Yeah. And that ended up I, being really good. That was, that was really good. Uh, the other one I think of too, remember, remember when we were developing the guest nurture path mm -hmm. and there were, there was tons of meetings with the nurture path. And when, when I say nurture path, I'm for, for those that may not know that I mean of like the guest communication path, right? Guest looks at, looks at a property guest, uh, either sends an inquiry or the guest uh, makes a booking. It's like, what are the communication points that happen along that path all the way to check-in time, to in-stay, to check-out time? 
And then for follow up, like after that, like what are those communications that are happening there? Because even though you may think, oh, well, that's just all guest communication. That's all like, you know, whatever. It's like, well, no, really, there's a revenue component to it. There's a distribution component to it. There's a technology component to it. There's a sales like and I think that was one of the one of the most, you know, frustrating, but also rewarding things that we did as a team with all these different departments with like the, the nurture path that I think absolutely affected revenue and distribution and the, the aspects of getting new business in because when guests feel like they're talked to in a very efficient, effective way, and they don't feel like they're just being blown up with a bunch of stuff, but everything has a purpose and it actually is rewarding and feels good. They want to come back to you and they want to book you again and they engage you more. And then also too, the way the departments were able to voice their concerns about, oh, yeah, I get this many phone calls about people talking about this or that, the other, and we were able to mitigate things. It, it, it definitely was a, a very rewarding thing to have that involvement. Um, and I think out of that and what you also said, John, too, is, you know, passion and innovation can't come from stagnancy. It has to come from discovery. And it has to come from something where people are very like excited and they discover something, you know, I mean, thinking of a kid when a, when a kid gets a Lego set and they, they bird build their first Lego set and they did it all by themselves. Like they want more, they want to go do more advanced things. They want to challenge things and want to do more. And that there's no different between that as a child and as an adult and figuring out something like when you discover something and you learn about it, that you just are hungry and you want more and you want to be creative and innovate and make things better. And so I think, a lot of this, what we're talking about setup wise, breeds people's discovery and people's passion and innovation to be a part of the team and do more. Totally. I think that um, a lot of what we're talking about, particularly for a scaling organization, it's different once your things are kind of solidified, but yeah. I don't think anyone in this space really has that. So, um, <clears throat> and maybe it's not beneficial to get stagnant, but if, as a leader looking at your organization scaling, I, I really think the important thing to do is to generate that sense of wonder and discovery, like you said, and to encourage your subordinates to grow that way. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, what we're doing is creative. These systems are extremely complex. And there's always something to learn if you if you just push people to dig a little bit. And people will want to dig a little bit if you give them the, the authority to do so. So I think, you know, something you is a leader. they're going to be turning over and they're going to leave. They're just not yeah. going to be happy. Or, or they're not ever going to push to find the solution that's going to work best, which is mm -hmm. almost worse, you know? Um, and so, you know, when people would come to me and we would have these things either just within my organization or that I knew were, I suspected were kind of um, interdepartmental uh, is I might know what I think is going on. It's like, they're telling me the problem. I'm like, okay, I think like, this is the issue. And this is where I would look like, well, but you know, I just need to tell people that right away. <laughs> Sometimes it's like, you just drop hints. It's like, why don't you do this? Why don't you take some time today and see if you can like come up with like three or four potential reasons why this is happening and maybe go talk to Doug and distribution and tell him what's going on. He might have some insight for you. You yeah. might already know what they're going to kind of come up with, but you need to give them the opportunity to build those pathways in their brain to think to themselves, oh, I should ask Doug about this stuff. Because then when you go ask Doug, Doug's going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen a problem like that. Like, why don't we look at the front end of these listings, see if they're working, you know, or something. Um, now, next time an issue comes up, they're going to think to themselves, maybe I should ask Doug or someone on the distribution team. You know, they'll build those patterns. And but yeah. you have to give people the the opportunity to develop those pathways through curiosity, not just through lecturing. Because if you lecture right. them, they don't they don't really build the pathway the same way, and they won't like go figure it out. And for these teams where you know, the, the ecosystem is just too complex. You need people to like wonder if something, if there's another way, then yeah. they know, you know? I did a I did a thing with my teams <clears throat> um, at, at Stay Alpha on the distribution team. We had three different teams. We had a, a OTA support or like a kind of like a, a sales. It was kind of like a sales support, but just for the OTA. So watching the reservations coming in, make sure the taxes and fees and all the things we're doing what they're supposed to and, and audit things. And then we had a distribution team that built all the new inventory listings and maintained all the connections. And then we had our guest review team who watched all the reviews, responded to them and, and alerted people. And one of the things we did as, as a, a team of three departments is we said, I, I let, I said, everybody needs to take one hour every week and it's a brain break. <clears throat> Meaning take that hour, go sit on the couch somewhere else in the office, go to a coffee shop off site, do something, journal, listen to music, 
but think creatively about something that <clears throat> is not within like your confines of what your job description is or whatever it is, but think about if there's something that you think the company could do better or could make the company better with regards to gaining more revenue, company morale, something, whatever. And <clears throat> even though maybe not a ton of ideas came out right away, people just felt better about things. Cause to your point, John, it's like they discover things and they figured out how to make it theirs and own it and just felt more passionate and wanted to be there. And, you know, one way to measure these things too, there's, there's a bunch of different softwares out there and I think they're pretty cheap, but like Reynolds United, we use one called factorial and it's a, <clears throat> it's a software. It's kind of like an HR software and it's based in their, I think they're a startup company out of Barcelona and they just raised a bunch of money again too, which is great. But it basically sends you <clears throat> automatic things through Slack or email, however you want to do it, but it'll send you like little surveys and be like, Hey, how was your week this week? Where's that? Where, how are you? Were you happy, sad, you know? And then it asks you like survey questions that the HR team or the department managers can actually submit and say, Hey, I'd like to find out this Intel on our staff and they submit it and it's all anonymous and you get some data and some insights to recommendations of things that people want to do better or things, whatever. And it, it really helps you to kind of pulse what's going on. In a, in a very discreet way that, you know, you can keep, you know, initiatives and changes and things in, in line for making people feel better about what they do. Yeah, I didn't start this way <laughs> when we started this conversation, but as I've thought about it more through our conversation, I really think that like the crux of what I think exists for, for silo breaking uh, really comes down to this kind of aspect of human nature, which is people, yeah. like, people like to share what they know. And yes. so if you're thinking about yourself as an individual and you know that these things are complex, the best way to engage with others is to ask them what they're doing, ask them what they've learned, ask them what's working for them. Because so out of that, you know, people want to share. And when people share, that gives you an opportunity to expand your horizon. That gives you, you know, the tilled soil to have new ideas. Um, and so I think cultivating an environment where you give your team the time and the authority to go ask other teams what they're doing is going is the best way to break a silo because that's where ideas and collaboration are going to come from they're going to yeah. come from playing on the natural human desire to share what you've learned and then to start talking about possibilities together um and so when i was at stay alfred it's something i, I always did and i encouraged my team to do um I hope that they did do it. I think we did it a lot within our mm -hmm. revenue organization. But uh, I would often just walk around the office. I know that's harder in a remote environment. but uh, And I would just sit down and ask people what they're working on. Yeah. And I got a lot of ideas about that. Sometimes those ideas were not super related to what I was doing. Sometimes they were. Sometimes it was just as much as me because I would talk to different teams. I would be able, I would just connect them, you know. But encouraging, you know, you're all we're, like we said before you're all the teams are always going to be moving towards silos as you scale so in order to counter that you can play off of something that's very natural for humans which is give your teams the okay and the time to go ask other people what they're doing and out of that you'll have solutions that you would never be able to figure out in a deductive or like you know we're going to sit down in a meeting and come up with a solution for this and you also have to be the person too as a leader to empower that behavior in the rest of your team. Meaning like an example is, um, I remember you did a great job of that with the revenue team, John at Stay Alfred and some of the some of the uh, revenue specialists would come over and be like, hey Doug, you got a second, I wanted to bend your ear about this, this and this. And I would think about it and I'd say, okay, wait a second. I do know about that really well and everything else because you know, not being conceived, I was considered like an expert distribution, whatever. But then I would say, hey, Aubrey sitting right over there is actually the assistant distribution manager or at the time was a specialist or whatever, but it's like, why don't you go sit with her and talk to her about it? She knows just as much about it as I do. And it was amazing to see the collaboration happening between people because one, you empowered that person or those specialists, revenue specialists to go talk to somebody else, right? To gather information. But then two, it also created a vehicle for somebody in the distribution team to share what they've learned and share how they've discovered things. And then you just start building this like empowerment of everybody feeling like they're a part of the, the plan and they're a big part of the thing, which they are, but, but having them feel that they are and understand they are is kind of what I think you're getting at. And that's, you know, part of us as leaders, you know, if you're a leader, listen to this, that's, that's part of your responsibility too. You may be the expert, you may be the person who knows what it is, but you got to empower the rest of your staff there, you know, 
with you working, working, you know, as a direct report to you, expand and be able to share too, so they can grow. And that's, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. It's like dealing with the contradictions is that we know that we have to build hierarchy, but mm -hmm. how do you within the hierarchy also build a culture that mitigates the risks of the hierarchy, which is specialization, right? Yeah. Or siloing. Um, I, you know, maybe in a, net, a future episode, we'll just talk about the concepts of leadership itself, because this is yeah. a little bit more esoteric of an idea. We are reaching about 45 minutes. So I would like yep. to let's just follow up with one question about like, let's let's just give like three takeaways that you think when you're building your kind of the revenue side of your organization, what should you consider uh, in doing that? So if I had to if I had to create three things, I would say one, uh, create a, a very religious, you know, time frame once a week that you get all these teams together and you meet. Uh, two is isolate that kind of arbiter or mediator, uh, so to speak, within your organization who can kind of speak the language of each of those departments to kind of help keep everybody rowing in the same direction and hear everybody and understand everybody. Um, and then the third part is um, it's kind of joined maybe, but transparency and fun. Just be just be transparent. Don't try to hide anything. Don't try to think that somebody else won't understand what you're talking about, whatever. Let them make that decision if they don't, because then I'll spawn questions. And then have fun. Like, do something fun with it. Put up fun gifts. Make fun of the fact that, you know, Denver did something weird as a market for you or something like that, or it's 420 or whatever. Um, or, or just take people out and go have beers or do something. But, like, make it fun and make it open and transparent. Those are my three things. Yeah, I'm going to be really aligned with you on these kind of three takeaways. My first one is going to be empower someone within mm -hmm. the interdepartmental stuff to be to, to be the person to, to unjam the log, to make the decision when it needs to be made uh, and make sure that person is the right person for it and that people respect them. Um, they don't have to necessarily be everyone's boss. Uh, hmm, if right. you're big enough, they probably will be. But you do need someone to kind of be the, the guy to make the decision when, when all the cases have been put on the table. Yeah. Um, second one I would say is both set aside some formal time to talk about what's going on uh, between the teams, just so that people can remain aligned on a micro level. I would go one step farther and also say that once or twice a year, you should have like a mini offsite for those teams to, to kind of step back, talk about all the things, the responsibilities that people are doing or that or should be doing that maybe aren't being done and, and arrange those among the teams. And also as part of that, you know, because a growing team, like those things are going to move around, remind your teams that all of these responsibilities are flexible because you are integrated uh, in a way. And that as you scale, you might need to move some of these, you know, it might be that like reviews are all under marketing initially because they're dealing with the advertisements. But something that happened at Stay Alfred is we actually ended up moving reviews and a lot of advertisement stuff to distribution. You know, yeah. so recognize that as you grow and by having these kind of consistent um, off sites where you get to work together as a team, be collaborative and kind of like restructure the responsibilities and levers. Not only does it help tell everyone who owns things and, and what you can do as you bring new people on, but uh, it also helps with the fact that those things may move around as you grow and it makes people more flexible and open to it, right? Yeah. Um, and then I would say the third kind of component is um, whether it's for yourself or if you're a leader and you have subordinates, encourage, build time to get yourself or your people to go to the other teams and ask them what they're doing. I think that, you know, when the time, if you have built a uh, habit of doing that consistently, you will be in a position when you actually need to have a meeting and, and put these teams together and say, like, we have something we need to figure out. How do we solve this problem? If you already are aware and have worked with these team members in a non-formal way, then you will have fertile ground to come up with good solutions. But if you haven't built that habit, you when you have to do those meetings, you're going to have a risk of not being able to, to do it or yeah. not being able to come up with a good solution because people don't understand how these things are integrated or they don't know how to work together. And so outside of the hierarchy, encourage people to operate outside of the hierarchy, learn about each other's stuff, try to come, empower them to come up with uh, potential solutions together without being a top-down approach, uh, and then build that kind of habit so that when you need to do it in a more formal way, you have fertile ground to do so. Yep, I agree.
I, I, I love this. Hey, I agree though. I think this could become like a whole other uh, episode of just like kind of leadership dynamics within the space of stuff, but it's um, <clears throat> it's really it's really important. I think on all fronts of what you you said with those three items, um, just just make people feel good, <laughs> just make them feel like they're part of it. Awesome. Well, tell us. Uh, we'll just recap who we are and who we represent, and then uh, we'll we'll let everyone be on their way. Yeah. So I'm I'm uh, Doug Trout, uh, head of revenue success at Reynolds United. Uh, been with the company actually. Tomorrow is my one year anniversary uh, oh, wow. with, with the company. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I'm I'm responsible for revenue success, which is uh, kind of the initiative that uh, Reynolds United is trying to do more for our clients um, outside of just connectivity. Um, we're not trying to just be the light switch that turns you on to get more bookings. We're actually trying to provide you more transparency and more information and insights uh, onto what those bookings are. Um, if you need some consultation with distribution strategy, even some revenue management strategy, we're, we're there for you with my, my expertise and being to help to do that. A um, uh, little side note, obviously, like we said in the beginning, I'll be at uh, Streamline Summit this week. So if you're attending Streamline, um, stop by the booth, say hi. Um, uh, John and I think we'll both be at uh, Verma in October. So make sure you come and see us. I think we're even going to try and record a, another episode in, uh, in, in the live at uh, Verma. So that's me. Awesome. And my name's uh, John DeRolay. I'm the uh, head of enterprise sales at Wheelhouse and resident um, revenue management expert. If you haven't heard of Wheelhouse, we are a revenue management and dynamic pricing platform. Uh, really have built one of the top, if not the top platform in the space, uh, leveraging some really deep data science that we've made totally transparent uh, to our users. We're really pushing transparency in the space uh, to change the paradigm from um, tell us to, to uh, audit us. Uh, so if you are looking for uh, pricing and revenue management strategy, you need some help in your scaling and automation, um, we're the platform to look at. And uh, feel free to reach out to me um, and have a conversation. We love to just talk about revenue strategy and learn more about the companies. So uh, really appreciate you guys' time. Doug, as always, love just hanging out and chatting with you. Yeah, man, uh, always. And uh, we look forward to continuing to uh, you know have some conversations that are, are beneficial to uh, everyone out there in the vacation rental SCR space as well. Yeah, and if, if anybody has out there still listening in on this episode, um, maybe submit back to us. We'll do these posts on uh, LinkedIn and whatnot. Submit, submit some posts on ideas of future episodes you might like to see or want to know about or make comments in the, the YouTube videos that we put up there. And, and if there's a, a hot topic you think is really important you want to discuss about or have uh, ideas for, um, let us know. We'd be happy to do that. Until next time, guys. <laughs>